This is New England Soccer Weekly with Tom Quinlan, Nick Giuliano, and Mike DeSilva on 790 The Score. Well, it's a historic Friday here on New England Soccer Weekly. The world is all talking about one thing right now. There's only one thing the world cares about. It involves New York City. It's the New England Revolution, of oh, course. I was going to say, it's not WrestleMania, is it? Well, it's definitely not WrestleMania. But it is WrestleMania week. I'm very excited for that. I'm wearing my truck line jacket this weekend in the press box. Let's so. go. Back to soccer. There Let's we go. It. Uh, hey, listen. There's a lot to enjoy around here right now. It's not like we're going to be suffering through another season. Clearly, 2022 oh, Tom, was an anomaly. No, Tom, I, we're on camera God. again. Don't, Tom, don't do this. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed watching the come-from-behind victory uh, for the New England Revolution over D.C. United at Audi Field. Uh, no Wayne Rooney on the sideline. Doesn't really matter. But uh, 2-1 victory. The kid, no buck. I mean, just a sensation this year. All about the kids on Saturday night. No Carlos for the first hour and then he comes on in well puts... that's uh, the, the kids are a definite storyline but carlos heel coming in the game changed the entire complexity of the and game, hopefully sure. he's fully healthy again because this is the game you want him ready for this is the circle of the calendar game this is the game that matters the most again it's new england soccer weekly i am tom quinlan nick giuliano mike da silva you know who we are how do you do so uh just opening thoughts mike i'll start with you what was the biggest thing that stuck out with you this last week uh, you know, I, I've been paying attention since Bruce started the season, you know, before the season kicked off, uh, talking about how positive and how uh, how much he was thinking about the, the younger players in regards to how much they were going to impact this team. So that was something going into the season I was paying attention to. And it's obvious he has a ton of faith in them. He's very happy with the way they've been playing, although he doesn't want to give them too much credit. He has, that's what you do as a coach, that's though. That's what you do as a coach. He did, you know, we'll get to that in a little bit. He did mention, no, he's made improvements, but let's not get crazy now. Right. Uh, so I did see, I did enjoy seeing that. And also, I feel like we've kind of answered a question that we've had for a couple of years now. We've been very happy with the play of Matt Polster since he's been with the Revolution. But we always had that question mark, is if they're going to run those two sixes there, if you're going to run with two center defensive midfielders, who's going to be the guy that you can fill in next to him? We've had... Many people come and go, including, uh, you know, they tried Tommy Mack there for a while. There's just many players we can run through the list. And I feel like they've they've found that guy who not only can help you on the defensive end in being that first line of defense there, but also help you transition on the counterattack and to offense with Noel Buck. It's this kid, an actual kid. Uh, so that's probably what stand out stood out to me the most. And no Latif Blessing this past week, either. correct? So now you get a hopefully and no get- Barrero and, and and some of these other guys that are on international duty. So and we'll get to this, but I think that speaks to a problem that you've had with this team for a while. It's depth, yeah. And those two players came in and did well. So my overall thought is this: and it's something that you texted after the game. I don't. I think the Nashville game was the most complete win this season, and it's because of the class of the opponent. It's because of what that defense had done prior to coming into Gillette Stadium and no Carlos Hill for the No Carlos minutes. Hill for 90 minutes. But what I will say, I think the best win is D.C. of yeah. the year because of how the game went. That first 19 minutes, it was all revolution. And the kids were having great shots on goal. They were moving the ball. Everything was going in their favor. And then D.C. took over. Ben Techie scored. A very nice goal going going into halftime. This is a revolution team last year that may have folded going into the last 45 minutes. But that didn't happen when Carlos Hill came on the field. First touch over to Bo. Scores a goal. Entire complexity of the game game uh, uh, switches. And not only that, you come away with a victory yeah. Yeah, on the road. Points. Regardless of who the opponent is, that is the best win of the season. And you got to look yeah. at it from this standpoint, too. You never want to say... Oh, they're throwing away a game. They're not. They're not as uh, concerned about leaving the, this game with three points. But you look at the way they started the game. The lineup we that talked they about on the show last week. Go back to, back and watch it. Thank you for watching. But we said that's a mental letdown game mm-hmm. in DC coming off a win like Nashville. So exactly. That's your point. Not to mention with the lineup you went with. You don't have your captain starting. You have some guys on international duty. Yep. You got a lot of young players out there on the road. You kind of. You hate doing it, right? You hate doing it. I hate talking about it. But sometimes you think, ah, maybe they're just playing for a draw here at best. And then they came from behind and won the game, which is what we saw them do. In 2021, Supporter Shield season, there wasn't one game all year that you felt like they were out of. Uh, and they came back and won a lot of those games, obviously, becoming Supporter Shield champions. So that was really good to see. And we've seen that so far. They're in these games to the end for the first five weeks. Yeah, again, five weeks. This is game six. It's match six. A big one against NYCFC that will break down. But again, Tom, four wins, one loss. 
you can't ask for a better start, really, with all the question marks that we had coming into the season. And then the, that win last week solidifies something that we didn't see pretty much at all last year. So, again, early in the season, but really good things. I mean, the storyline of the game has to be Noel Buck, right? Mm. It just, I, you know, he wins you the game. He started every game yeah. Yeah. this year. And he's looked good. And he's like, he's gotten he, progressively better every week. He's so calm. He comes back and plays defense like you were pointing out. And the decision-making for a 17-year-old like him, I think, really does open you up to the idea that he's probably not going to be here long. And it's already starting to ruminate in the media. Like, even outside of here. From yeah, Char- From Charles Boehm, yeah. uh, who works down in the D.C. area. I think he works for the league website. I forget who exactly he works for, but I mean, they're even asking him about his U.K. passport and playing overseas. So this kid has certainly made a big impact early, and I think part of the reason why you have four wins to start the year, especially you know, at least one of them, you can definitely put on his back. Yeah, and I think that, you know... We might not have enough time to kind of break this down fully in, in what I think about how when these rumors start to formulate. I mean, this is still we're still working off a very small sample size here. And I, and I think that it's getting kind of crazy. You know, when you have guys like Matt Turner and you guys, Adam Books and, and some of these other guys, Tejan. Tejan Buchanan, they give you a much larger sample size. They are pretty much fully developed physically by the time that they were moving on uh, into, you know, across the pond there. No buck, still very young. Okay, I think everybody loves well, to just. You hear jump what he to... says about the media because he he knows the hype's out there. He's had people ask him about it. Sam yeah. from the Blazing Musket brought it up the other day at media. This is how he responds to the rumors of him being linked in in, in England. Well, I just wanted to ask after uh, the DC game, you were uh, talking with Charles Baum, and you mentioned that you have a UK passport, and that if you you know if the offers came, you could go now. So overall, could you just kind of talk about your aspirations as a player, and wanting to go to Europe, and if you feel you're ready as a player to possibly make that move? Yeah, I do have a I have dual citizenship. You know, I could it wouldn't be a problem, uh, I don't know, immigration wise, for me to go over there. But uh, you know, I always I. Would love to play there at some point in my life. You know, I mean, it's, it's been my dream since I was very young. And, um, you know, I think I still have a lot of work to do. You know, I'm nowhere. No, I don't think I'm anywhere near that right now. Um, I'm still growing and learning. And, you know, it just takes time for me to really get up to that level. I mean, it's a great answer. It's that, a very that is, truthful answer. That's what I mean. That is the answer. That yeah. should, a good head on his shoulders. That yeah. should be the answer. And no disrespect. We've done this for years since Mike and I have joined. No disrespect to the, to MLS. That is where you want to play. Yeah. And and it's comforting to hear him say that because as play, that's of course. I mean, we didn't get there, but that's if you were asking me where I would want to play, it would be in the EPL. That's I what mean, it is. It, it's it's the standard. It's it's whatever you know. People have known this now for years and years. That's not to be. But I think the fact that he didn't ignore that and be like no i'm just focusing on you know the task at hand and here in new england and you know we didn't give you the the bruce the bill belichick bill answer, belichick answer. Yeah. he's giving you the like yeah he's my honest, dream yeah. is to play that he's a kid i mean it's that's it's very much in reach for him but like he said he's got a lot of growing to do they have a good team here he obviously enjoys his time in new england saying like yeah it's possible but not right now like so, I'm, I'm chilling one of the things with that answer that i wanted to bring up and i wanted to throw to mike because he coaches players of this age which i think shows the difference between these three players obviously the talent is there but in an answer like that and you watch esmir jack and noel play last saturday night the word confidence i think is what separates them they these are confident players these are 17 18 19 year old players playing with professionals that have been out there for a while and you can't really tell the difference that was my didn't make any mistakes that didn't really make any mistakes that was my big takeaway and i loved how both of them esmir and jack got a shot on goal very quickly in the game so to me that just shows they're they're not daunted by Mm. the big lights the the confidence is there confidence makes uh for for play for kids for just anybody at that age and you can call them kids are 17 years old and, and you know they confidence makes the biggest difference because you have to believe that you're that you belong there you know and you're not physically maybe at your peak yet so these are guys that 
they have to also understand, like, hey, maybe if I'm getting body off a ball here and there, which is not very often. I mean, they're holding their own physically. Yeah. You have to also understand that you have room to grow there. It's about the mental part of the game. It's about knowing where to be on the field. It's about, uh, you know, having that feeling like you belong there. And, you know, obviously I'm not coaching people at that level. I'm coaching at the high school level, similar age. But yeah, the similar age. That was my, that was right, my yeah, point. similar age. But yeah. the, the, the big part of that when you're dealing with kids who aren't, you know, they, have an ex- they don't have a lot of life experience yet at that point. You kind of got to temper that. And I think that's why Bruce does kind of like the hardo aspect of it. Like, yeah, no, he's grown, but he's, uh, I mean, let's not get out of, get crazy here. He hasn't grown that much. That, that's how you coach. That's coaching 101. Hello, Bruce. Thank you for taking the time. I just wanted to ask about Noel Buck. Obviously, he got off to a pretty good start this season. Are you at all surprised by his play, or is this kind of what you expected from him? No, I think uh, he's a little bit ahead of schedule for sure. He, he's done a real good job. Next, we'll go to Rich Thompson, and he'll be followed up by Seth. Rich, you're unmuted now. Right, well, yeah, I kind of didn't want to follow up on that. What, what is keeping um, Noel Buck in the starting 11 for five straight games? What, what's he, what are you seeing on the field from him? Well, uh, th- there's nothing that's keeping him off. Uh, he's playing a, a good, solid game for us. Uh, each and every game, he hasn't played. He hasn't played 90 minutes in every game, but he's been good, uh, very reliable uh, defensively. Uh, been, been, he's been good in possession. Uh, he's he's helped us create some chances in the attack. You know, he, he's been pretty well rounded in this game. So, so the one thing that I take out of there is when Bruce says to Sam. And I think that's the key. The key of the soundbite is Noel's ahead of schedule. Mm. You know who's not ahead of schedule? Oh God! Why do you? Why? I'm just saying. We're focusing there is something on, to be no, said. Tom, we're focusing. There is something to be said that uh, this kid is. They, but but is, is, is I know focused. we filmed this out of yes. order, but I want to say that just keep whatever. Just keep watching the show. I know. Is he, is he coming <laughs> off of an injury? Is he coming from another country? You're unbelievable. No, you're 17 years old. You I already, understand. You this. Have, He's coming from Seacon Kai. You have the Seacon. answer to this already in this show. So just keep watching. I, I, yes, just keep watching. Just saying, there's I, something to be said about that. Stay tuned. Somebody's for, ahead of schedule. Somebody's behind schedule. Let's just just say, pointing it out, ladies and gentlemen. Let's just say just pointing it out. Hypothetically, we filmed an interview before this segment where Tom asked and answered this question. You, I, didn't, I didn't ask that one. No, no, no. But meaning it was asked and yeah, answered. I, I and asked you, the question about yeah, Vrioni. You got, yes, you got, got the you. answer that we've been telling you the entire season. You just don't want to hear it. Uh, it, pretty much the... <laughs> it's become your personality you know, at this point. It's to, it's to just find like a, a random player, a striker, or somebody. This is what he does. Spe- if you're a designated player, listen, if you're a designated player on the Revolution... Tom is not your friend. All right, <laughs> he is not your friend. He'll never pretend. He, he will only like you when you score. I mean, at least I'm honest. I, I I will not pretend to be your friend. So you know. Uh, yeah. But the theme of this week at media training is not Carlos. Is he coming back? Yes or no? I mean, there were a couple of questions in there. I don't think you really care about that because this team's playing fine without Carlos right now. So I don't think you need to shoehorn him back in okay. there. Okay. Well, I don't agree with that. Fair. I, this is we've done this again before. And it was, and when he is ready up, to play, he will play. I understand. And I'm I just think saying, it's going to be this week. It's nice. You to, don't hold him off just because you're four and one. You get hit. This is the best player in the league two years ago. You, you brought up before. The, my biggest kvetch with this team is that the lack of depth. Well, you have that depth there. It's showing in your youth. They're stepping up. They're playing well. Why? Question answered. Great, uh, Bruce. Can I follow up on uh, some of the young guys, Nolbach and. Uh, Jack and Esmir as well. You've known them for um, a little while now. Have they improved greatly in the last year or so? And what has impressed you the most about their games? They they have improved, and uh, you know you use the word greatly. I, 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 I'm not sure about that, but they've they've definitely improved. Uh, they're they're all a little different. You know, Jack Jack has only been with us since January. Uh, you know, he's he's with the cat academy before he left. For, for Georgetown, but I think uh, uh, going to a good Division One school for that fall semester was helpful for him. So the the physic, you know, he's he was playing against older players, so the physicality and the running he's 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 used to, and uh, he he wasn't at all intimidated uh, coming in with our team in January. You know, Nolan Noel's been around for a number of years, and Esmir's been around for about a year or so, and. 
uh, they've they've all improved in their own their own ways, and uh, they can continue to improve. And I think uh, they're obviously now training with the first team each and every day, and that's uh, that's helped their improvement. You know, I, I I know I know we've spent a lot of time here uh, on the show talking about Noel, but I think it it also should be said about Jack P. I thought he had a really good introduction to the league. He looks calm. He looks comfortable. Wasn't afraid to take guys one on one. Had a couple of shots that you thought, whoa, that might have went in. So uh, listen, all around it, it was a really good, gritty, grinded out win. On a night where it felt like it was a good time to test this team, can you find those good gritty wins? Love it, love it on the road. I think it's a it's it's the best start I've ever seen here for I'm a revolution. Sure, I'm sure team. they're happy that you love it, Tom. Yeah. Well, you know, I know we are because it just makes this show a lot more uh, enjoyable, palatable, palatable, manageable. Uh, you know, especially late on a fr- well, late for us on a Friday. Uh, but yeah, overall, just a great win. You got to feel good about it and. It's making that LAFC loss look a lot more like just an anomaly. Yeah. Perfect word. Like, does not represent, what this, represent team is. what this team is. It it's was a bad spot. Ba- weird. A lot of things went into it. Right. A lot sure. of things going on there, and you can kind of write that one off as like maybe don't, not saying they go there and win that They're game. They're not going to be 35 and 1. Right. For the year. Exactly. Yeah, but, yeah, that, you that's know, not it, in, in, indicative of what this team is. They're not is a 4 so nothing difference between top of the, you know, the but, rest of the league. But this is a big uh, this is a big game. I agree with Tom. It, it's a circle on the schedule because it, it is that Boston New York field. This is a team that knocked you out of the playoffs two years ago after well, yeah, we, we hate field. We hate you, NYFC. But, it, NYCFC. NYCFC. Thank I'm you. sorry. But again, so and this the is a team seat. that hasn't been great on the road this year, but it is not to take lightly because. Because this team hasn't fully formed yet, this NYCFC team. Right. And you lot, again, you know, as Mike said before, you had a lot of guys that you were missing to international break. So it's really hard to look deep into this. Type the one of- thing that stood out to me, though, again, you, you can throw that game against Houston away because of the player. It was a that Houston NYCFC game last Saturday was a really poor game. All also, around. Tom's I'm surprised, Tom, you haven't gone in on, uh, you know, the league about having all those games with so many players, which we know you'll see but shortly. The MLS Cal- has done that for years. Right. But it's it, you would think that there would be an adjustment made. You know, the rest of the world is taking international break when there's international duties to be had. Yeah, there was no EPL. Yeah, there was nothing. Nothing. No leagues in the world played in Europe last week. Uh, so but that's neither here nor there. But one thing that stood out to me about NYCFC in Five games, they've had 16 yellow cards. That That is extremely undisciplined for any level. But for a professional team to have that many cards through five games, it's something to, something to watch. It's good and to it, see if you're playing against them, That's though. what like I mean for the revolution. Yeah, you, you, that's something to watch, mentally speaking. And yeah. with Barrero back... You know, the one thing that Barrero does is that he draws fouls. Carlos, what does he do? He draws fouls. Most the referee, foul especially the at home. Like, the Revs are very good at home. They definitely find a way to get the advantage with the referee at home. I've never really seen a referee screw the Revs over at home. It's in, in the Bruce era, at least. So, you're going to ask him, you think yeah. he agrees with you? Yeah. Yeah, but I, 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 I mean, if we're, I don't think so either. I think every game last year he said something about the referee. Yeah, he said every game something about every game. You go in every game pretty much the last two years where he's mentioned something about the refs. Um, but regardless, at the end of the day, I think this is a this is certainly the match that really you want to test yourself up against the rest of the Eastern Conference to see where you are. Uh, you, you have a bad taste in your mouth anytime New York City FC comes in here now after what happened in 2021. And now is the time to, to really prove if you're a top three or four team or one of the top teams in the conference, which is what we've heard from Gary Smith this year. It's what we've heard from the Charlotte FC uh, coach. So that's that's where we stand going into this weekend. And let me tell you why some of these games are going to become more and more important as the season goes along is because Atlanta – you know that's a good team that's a good team and that's not a team you're going to want to have to go play on the road um definitely they they can score especially if they're going to keep Tiago Almeida all year forget yeah. about and, it exactly. and, they, and they have they, you know they have their crowd i mean it's just an incredible environment and when they're good it's great for the league and it's bad for the rest of the Eastern Conference. Well, I know this is the other side, Tom, but I want to talk about St. Louis for a second. I mean, this is unprecedented what's happening. Five and oh. It's a beautiful the, thing. The last three the last two games, I think they're they've scored seven and given up none, a plus yeah. seven goal differential. I mean yeah. and then you talk about the atmosphere there. Is, League's in a good spot. And in, in your wildest imagination, did you think that this expansion team could do this? That's what they are. I don't correct? think you expect it for anything for any expansion team. I, I think they are the Vegas Knights of not that you people like comparing sports but 
Um, I mean, it's it's. It, it, it's a fair, team, yeah. and that, in, in the in the vein of expansion teams that come into a league and get off to a hot start, they remind you of the Vegas Knights. You happy for Taylor Twelman? We're trying to get Taylor Twelman on this show. He's a very busy man, but we're hoping to get him on soon. Yeah. Uh, it's something that we've been I'm working sure he on. Will. He's, he's, so he's a uh, guy. yeah, we want to. Uh, well, he was. Uh, we'll talk about what he was kvetching about uh, a little bit because I want to make sure we leave enough time for uh, Callum. But uh, one last thing before we uh, come out of this segment, the uh, Revs go on a pretty significant home stretch here. Uh, throughout the month of April. I'm glad you brought up. This is significant because I'm someone, uh, if you watch this show, I'm a proponent of let the season play out, that you can't rush to a judgment one way or another, four, five, six, 10, 15, even 20 games in. But four games at home in April, that, that's, a big de- that's a big deal. These are points that you don't want to leave on the board mm-hmm. this month. New York City FC coming up next. Then next week, Montreal on Easter weekend at home or Passover weekend, whatever you celebrate. Uh, Columbus and New England on the road. So the Revs will be the following week and the Revs will be in uh, bus. And then wrapping up uh, the month of April, you're home against Sporting Kansas City. You're home against uh, Cincinnati. So four to five uh, games here are at home. And, and again, you have to temper expectations. Yes. They're not going to win every game. You'd like them to win every game. If they do, fantastic. But four uh, four home games in a month, you got to get points. We'll end with yeah. this one. Here's Bruce on the uh, home stretch. Um, here we go. There we go. Hey, Coach, uh, you're 2-0 at home right now. you got four of the next five at home. Just talk about the stretch coming up and creating some separation in the Eastern Conference. Yeah, they're important games. You know, in this league, you know, you, you need to get your points at home and We'd certainly like to get three points each and every game, and that would obviously position us well after, after uh, the month of April is done with because in May we go, we go on the road for an extended period of time. So those things do balance themselves out, but uh, uh, playing well at home is important, and we've generally been, been a real good team at home, so hopefully we can continue, continue that. Yeah, no, no real uh problems with me there so i think listen this is how you start to set the tone this weather's weekend. still not going to be great saturday night though. It'll be warmer but just not yeah great. still i think it's raining for this week and next week right now yeah revs new Beautiful. york city fc yep. tonight seven thirty, free on mls season pass and we'll talk to callum williams from mls season pass next here on new england soccer weekly Stay yes tuned. next we'll talk to him next next. Yeah. next all right welcome on back to new england soccer weekly Another week where, it, you know what, this one feels like a circle the calendar game. You've had two of those so far this year. The first one was against LAFC, didn't go the way you wanted it to, but I think there's a lot of reasons why that game didn't go the way you wanted it to. But this one, this one feels like this is where you can learn a lot about this New England Revolution team. Let's talk about it with the man who's going to be on the call for this weekend, Callum Williams from MLS's Season Pass on Apple TV. Callum? Welcome to New England Soccer Weekly in Providence, and you're joining us, actually, if you're watching the show on YouTube this week, you're joining us from the Revolution uh, Training Facility. Yeah, thank you for having me, chaps. Really appreciate it. Yeah, um, the Revolution Training Facility is glorious. Um, it is as state-of-the-art as they come. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to have been to a handful of training facilities now across Major League Soccer, and it's up there with the very best of them, so I'm sure it plays its part when it coming to attracting players. It's it's very, very good. The gym is gorgeous. The fields are in pristine condition. It's a wonderful facility. You know, there was an interesting comment that came out this week from Giacomo Vrioni's agent. He was talking to some Italian media, and you're talking about the training facility here. Uh, Vrioni's agent said, uh, if you go to the New England Revolution Sports Center, you realize how far behind we are in Italy, and you get angry. And you do realize that the structures are more advanced than us, there's no doubt. I mean, it was just a really glowing review, and it's another glowing review for this Revolution Training Facility, which I, I've, I've seen it. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. I saw, you know, they gave us a tour right before the world shut down, but they talk about it like it's the Taj Mahal. <laughs> and it's it's and, and we were talking before we came on here. We were talking about you were talking about how you think it's the standard in MLS. You know, it's so funny. And you've been around the league for a long time. The Revs went from really at the bottom of the league when it came to training facilities and facilities in general, and pretty much Sands Stadium. Uh, the Revs would be at the top of the league in almost every category right now. Yeah, I mean, look, I wouldn't go as far as saying it's one of the wonders of the world, but it's certainly one of the wonders of Major League Soccer for sure. And. Um, Again, I've been very fortunate to see a lot of other of the training facilities and ones in uh, in Los Angeles, Miami, Atlanta, uh, Kansas City all, all stand out. But but the revs absolutely are up there. And I'm sure it does play its part. You know, I mean, 
Brioni's um, agent w- was was right. I mean, look, I'm very fortunate to have seen a lot of other football across the world, and the facilities that we have here in North America are sensational. Um, they would be as good as as anywhere across Europe, and, and I'm sure there are many people that come over here, and they are doing this now across Europe. They're coming over here to Major League Soccer to see why it's going so well and what they're doing right. And so when they come and see facilities like this, it's no surprise when their jaws hit the ground and they see what we have available here. So when we just, I'm sorry to yeah. cut you off, Mike, but when you talk about the gap between U.S. soccer and the world, you know, that's always been the conversation, right? We always talk about it from the competitive mm-hmm. level, but now it feels like that conversation enters a new dimension because United States billionaires that are investing in MLS soccer have deeper pockets to spend on facilities like this. So does that close the gap a little bit where, hey, if I'm a player, if my choice is between QPR or Inner Miami, I might want to go to Inner Miami now and play with David Beckham. For sure, that, that that's that's a very valid point there, and and I, I think we're seeing examples of that already. In fact, I know of a handful of players who had similar offers, uh, and instead they chose to come to Major League Soccer because I think people can see what it's becoming here now, and more so what it's going to become. Maybe even during their time here in Major League Soccer, which you know, when you think of a, a soccer player from a professional point of view, their careers usually last about fifteen years or so. Um, and, and I think people are very, very excited to see where this league is going to be. Um, I personally am excited to see where it's already gone and where it's come from. Um, as you mentioned, I've been doing the league for, for some time. And whilst when I first came over in 2011, it was a very good league. It was fine. Um, the, the leaps and bounds that it has, has made has been astronomical. And, and it's, it's only going to get bigger and better. So, yeah, look, I mean, we, we are seeing there are an abundance of examples of European-based players, South American-based players who would usually go elsewhere in Europe, would usually go elsewhere in South America. Now they're choosing to come to Major League Soccer for a variety of different reasons. The quality of the soccer has gotten better. Um, the money is, is here to attract people, as you mentioned. There's obviously a lot of investment at the moment, which is a good thing. The training facilities, the stadiums, the fan base, the relevance of the sport. The most exciting thing about Major League Soccer right now, in my opinion, and I, I, I did a similar interview the other day and spoke about this, the most exciting thing, in my opinion, is that soccer in North America now is becoming and is a part of the global uh, footballing conversation. Um, and that just wasn't the case even five or six years ago. Now I'm having you know, scouts and agents calling me, asking about certain players and stuff. And, and I have broadcasters back in, in the UK and over in Europe um, who are covering Major League Soccer, by the way, because now... All these broadcasters around the world are, are providing, you know, world feeds. Obviously, Apple provides the feed, and, and they do the commentary from wherever they are across the world. And um, and and people want to watch Major League Soccer, so it's only going one way. It, it's a tremendous time to be involved in Major League Soccer, for sure. And you know, to kind of piggyback off of that, the, how much of that, you know growth in the last since you've been with the league in 2011 how much of that growth do you put into some of these smaller markets some of the U- these usl clubs that have come up and some of these you know teams that have been have built their own culture and maybe a smaller market like you see overseas in in england with with the championship and, and the lower divisions now they're coming up into the mls and you have the average viewer seeing that like wow they're packing this you know the games in seattle and portland and in you know charlotte how much of that do you think impacts the overall product of MLS as well in, in this, you know, being able to sell it to players from overseas? Yeah, look, it's a tremendous point because <laughs> some of the crowds here are, are as good, if not better, than crowds across Europe. And, and we use Europe as a loose term, really, don't we? Because when we think of Europe, we always think of the English Premier League and the Bundesliga in Germany, La Liga in Spain. Um, I don't think Major League Soccer is quite on that level yet. But if, if you, and I had this a couple of years ago, there was a, a player who sort of remained nameless who, um, who had an option to, to go and play uh, overseas in Scandinavia. It was either in Norway or Sweden or, or Denmark or somewhere along those lines. Um, and uh, we spoke about it. And um, I remember saying, if you want to go for the life experience, then that's up to you. But from a footballing point of view, you're better off in Major League Soccer mm. because it's growing so quickly here. And quite frankly, the soccer is better here in, in the U.S. and, and Canada now than, than it is uh, over in, in, in Scandinavia and, and other parts of Europe. And a lot of that comes down to, going back to your point, the facilities and the investments, but also the fan bases here as well. If you go to a match in Portland, for example, I think that is the standard of what soccer can be in North America. Um, and we've had some wonderful examples of NFL stadiums has been sold out on a regular basis, like Seattle, like Atlanta. Um, like Charlotte, as you mentioned, 
Um, and if they're not sold out, they, they get some very good crowds regardless. Um, and I saw a stat the other day, actually, where somebody insinuated that there are more people attending Major League Soccer games than are attending the NBA and NHL games, which mm. I thought was, was a staggering uh, stat to see because I thought we, we all thought we would get there at some stage, but, but not this quickly. And so there have been a, a variety of reasons as to why that's potentially happening. But the, the one contributing factor, more than most, I think, is the fan bases that, that you allude to and the passion that they show, the culture that they've created. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> fans in Minnesota, in Kansas City, uh, here in New England, um, NYCFC as well. I've, I've been fortunate enough to spend some time around those fans recently. Um, the Pacific Northwest is a, a, a footballing hotbed. Um, it's coming, like, Soccer is coming here in this country. It's been coming for a long, long time. Um, but it's the, the most exciting thing is is that it, it's it's here now. It's here to stay. And the most exciting thing is is to where it's going to go. Um, now we, we are seeing a league that I think is 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 of comparison to many across Europe. And, and I I've always said this. I do wonder if if this league was situated geographically anywhere else in the world. If it was in Central Europe, for example. I would bet a lot of money, and I'm not a betting man, but I would bet a lot of money that a lot of people would be paying a lot more attention to this around the world than they already are. And, and that, that, that's interesting to think about because already we're having so many eyeballs on this league, more than it's ever had, and right now it's blossoming. Well, just to expand on that too, Callum, uh, five weeks going into now the sixth week here in MLS with this Apple deal and you being a part of it. Like Tom said, you, you've done broadcasts all over the world. What has this partnership been like with Apple going into week six so far? It, it's been great. I mean, look, it's, a, it's a, a new production, so it's not without its imperfections for sure. Um, but so far, it's, it's been sensational. Um, and I was having this conversation the other day, and I think if you, if you were to put it up alongside a lot of other soccer coverage worldwide, I, I think it would fit in marvellously. I, I don't think there's too much difference at all. And that, that's saying a lot, considering, as you mentioned, what are we now, week five or week six? It's, um, it, it's saying a lot. So, again, that's something I'm looking forward to seeing long term, how that looks as well, because this is a 10-year deal. And that's the thing as well we need to remember. Whilst obviously it's good to, to make a first impression, and I, and I think that first impression has been good, um, let's not forget this is a 10-year thing. Uh, and, and Apple are really behind it. Apple wants, wants to... to push and press and prod in all the right directions. Uh, they believe in it. They've obviously invested a lot of money. Um, they've got two and a half billion reasons to, mm. to, to want to invest into it and, and, and see why it's good. So um, it's been tremendous so far. We've been fortunate to, um, to be, be going around several different markets. And this will be my second time back here to New England. And I've got a, a, a couple coming up over the course of the next few weeks as well, uh, which is good for me because I live in New York City. So it's not too much of a hassle mm -hmm. to travel to. Um, but it's it, it's tremendous. Apple have been, Apple, I would argue, have been the partner that Major League Soccer have wanted for a long, long time. Um, and it is, in, in fact, it, I'm assuming your old friend Taylor Twelman had mentioned this a couple of uh, a couple of times over the introductory period of, of the deal. Right now, we can unapologetically cover Major League Soccer. Uh, it felt as though before um, Major League Soccer was looking for airtime um, from from a network point of view. That's not the case anymore. They, they have their platform, we have our platform, um, and it feels like it's only just getting started and it's going to grow wonderfully over the course of the next few years. Yeah, and, and even looking locally here, it was something we always uh, complained about because, you know, we obviously we cover mostly the revolution here and we'd go into our local coverage and it would literally, the coverage would start as kickoff went, like as the whistle blew for kickoff. So you got no pregame, you barely got a postgame, and now with, you know, with Apple TV and MLS season pass, you get the total package. It's been incredible. And just one last question on that uh, aspect before we get into the game this weekend. Um, how, how much does that go towards a player deciding on coming here from South America or from Europe? Because, you know, previously, if they had family that they were leaving behind, not necessarily leaving behind, but that they were moving away from, they weren't able mm. to watch their games it, simply or without some type of connection or VPN or whatever it may be. How much of being able to access games anywhere in the world do you think helps uh, selling a player to come to the MLS? I think it helps, but I, I don't think it's a major contributing factor because I think I think the major factor of them being attracted to come here are facilities like the one that I'm standing in right now because this is where the players will spend every single day of their footballing lives at the training facility. And 
stadiums absolutely play their part as well. I, I did a game in Minnesota last week and the stadium there is, is astronomical. If you haven't had a chance, I highly recommend you go. And we spoke earlier on about the, the stadiums in, in Portland and uh, the atmospheres um, in, in, in certain markets, in, in a lot of markets nowadays, but there are a handful that, that I think are um, a, a proper example of, of what soccer can be in this country and uh, and indeed what it is becoming. But yeah, I mean, look, I, I know of a couple of players that have said that it's it's been amazing that their families can now watch them without having to worry about some sort of illegal stream somewhere. Um, week one, I was in Cincinnati and uh, there's a, a Nigerian central midfielder, Obina Wobodo, who had uh, had said to the press on the, the Tuesday after that first game um, against Houston that uh, his family in Nigeria had no problem watching the game. And and that's 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 a really, really big plus point for Apple TV. Mm. Um, and it, it's been a, a tremendous adventure so far. IMG are doing a wonderful job producing it. Um, and it's going to be very, very good to see where it goes. It's it going to be very, very interesting to see where it goes. Yeah. It does. The studio facility um, in New York amazing. City is, is sensational. Yeah, so... And this is the exciting thing, though, chaps, is we're only just getting started. Right. And you know what? You're going to be able to watch a great game this weekend between uh, the New England Revolution and New York City FC. And free, coming... right? Free. Yeah, it is free this weekend. That's free. right. Yes, it is free this weekend going on Apple global. TV, uh, MLS's season passes. <laughs> You know what a derby is. You know what a good derby is. You've been you, you're you're the expert on it. So uh, forever, we've been trying to figure out who the Revs' real rival is. But now, as we've kind of get into you know, New York City FC's has established history. Now, you know they're not the baby of the league anymore. Is this a derby? The Revs and New York City FC. I mean, it's one thing to break down the game. I mean, everybody's still trying to find you know their footing. Still, the Revs look great after five weeks. But I think. I think this is more fun for fans. You know, are the Revs have a real rivalry here with New York City FC after everything we've been through the last couple of years? I would argue uh, you chaps are probably in a better place to answer that than me. But, but from, from my experience, um, you know, as I mentioned, I, I've just recently moved to New York City and uh, there is hatred for sports teams, for sure. Um, I, I was only in a restaurant the other day and, and overheard a, a disagreement, I think we should call it, mm-hmm. between a Yankees fan and a Red Sox fan. Um, which I, uh, I thought was compelling and, and entertaining for sure. Um, and uh, although I'm not sure, I, I th- they both left the restaurant at the same time. I'm, I didn't peer into the parking lot to see if they had a fist fight or anything. But um, <laughs> it's uh, look. I mean, the, the point is, is that there's obviously um, rivalry between the two cities when it comes to sports for sure, and a variety of other things as well. But um, so there's no reason why this one can't be right. Um, and that there have been, as you mentioned, um, games in the past where. One has gotten the better over the other. Um, New England, I know, haven't haven't won the last three here at Gillette Stadium against New York City FC uh, in all competitions. They did have that um, late winner with Adam Buxa back in 2021 at Red Bull Arena, which kind of, you know, was Matt Turner's coming out party, which kind of, I thought, led yes. him to getting picked up by Arsenal. <laughs> yes, well, one of many reasons, I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah one of um, many, you're right. It, it's, um, look, I mean, it, it, it has to be a rivalry, right? I mean, given what the other sports do and, and, and how uh, fearless those irritations with the opposing city are uh, in other sports. This, this has to be a rivalry. And, and I think we're starting to see some sparks. We're starting to see some, some flames ignite. Um, and the only way it's going to, to get better is, is if we have more games between these two. And playoff games help, you know, like, like the one in, in 2021, uh, which I, I know we don't want to go too deep into on, on, in this part of the world. But... Mm. Um, don't you speak know, too it, loudly. I don't want to get you kicked out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on what type of but day no, Bruce I, is having. There, well, yes. I was, I, do you know what? I couldn't believe it, actually. Bruce Arena, we had media availability the other day, and he was really, really nice to us, and I was really surprised because he's, <laughs> he's, he's a very, very nice individual, but um, clearly has um, has his preferred individuals. And, um, Take I was it from us. He has his days. Right. Unless he just hates Take us. Take it yeah. from you. <laughs> Take it from Tom. <laughs> Tom's not usually on his good side, Callum, so you got one up on there. Uh, I will say, Callum, though, being 4-1 and one probably helps uh, the coach's demeanor right now. But I want to ask you about NYCFC. I know it's difficult. Mm-hmm. We're in week six. There's so much of the season left. But this is a team that has two wins, both of those wins at home at Yankee Stadium. They've had a little bit more difficulty on the road with a tie and two losses. Why do you think that's the case with them coming into Gillette? Well, last week in Houston was obviously difficult because they were missing a couple of players, which the whole league were missing. I think it was 90 players overall the league were missing last year, which was uh, preposterous in my opinion. But um, James Sands played in at centre-half and, and did well, but obviously they, they didn't have Maxime Chano at centre-half, who 
who has been a stalwart for them alongside Thiago Martins. Um, I, I'm very interested to see uh, who Bruce goes for in terms of a centre-forward role. I know over the last couple of weeks they've gone with two centre-forwards, which has been interesting because New York City FC, I, I think they actually, the two centre-halves, who I'm assuming are going to start, will be Shano and Martins, they often like to play up against uh, a big centre-forward, somebody who resembles a target man, as opposed to somebody who runs in behind. Now, if it is, let's just say, for example, um, it's, it's Bo and, and, and Wood, which, which has been the partnership over recent weeks, um, Bo will, will drop in a little bit because he's creative as well as a goal scorer. Um, and yes, he pulls off the shoulder and, and he's very good in the final third and can score goals. But um, when he was at um, uh, Racing and, and then Tijuana down in South America and in Mexico, uh, he was actually preferred as a sort of a deep lying forward, if you will. And, and what, what that will benefit, uh, how that will benefit the Revs will be, I wonder if Bo will pull one of the centre-halves out of position and then Bobby Wood will nip in behind because Bobby Wood is that centre-forward that can actually run in behind, which, as I mentioned before, is something that they're not particularly comfortable with. Um, so I think that's a key one to watch, in, in, indeed, if that is the, the way that Bruce goes with it. Um, but Carlos Hill is, is the main instigator for the Revs, no doubt about it. And on the other side, New York City FC... Um, Santiago Rodriguez has been sensational uh, there is a comfort with them playing at home uh, and those dimensions at Yankee Stadium those field dimensions um, it's a lot tighter um, and teams playing at a high line are often caught out so but it's funny I, I spoke to Nick Cushing the head coach of NYCFC yesterday and he said actually you know we, we train on a regular size field so actually playing at Yankee Stadium uh, playing at uh, Gillette Stadium rather and playing at all these opposing venues actually suits us a bit more because we like to play an open game and we can open up a little bit more um, on, on the road. So um, they're, they're a good team. I think the, the biggest thing about them right now is they need a centre forwards. Um, the supporting cast behind the forward is as, as good as you'll find in Major League Soccer for the most part, particularly in the Eastern Conference with Pereira, uh, Rodriguez, who I mentioned, Pellegrini's been good. Um, but Talis Magno, I think everybody knows he, he's playing at centre forward right now, but he's not naturally a centre forward. And um, whilst Nick Cushing has said he's enjoyed the challenge and it's it's provided him with, with several different thoughts and, and angles, and he's learnt a lot from it. I, I think they need to get a centre forward in desperately over the course of the next couple of weeks before the window shuts. And I think the that was a similar issue with, with the Revolution last year after the departure of Adam Buxa was they struggled having a centre forward. They went and picked up Vrioni. Uh, unfortunately, he was you know he had injuries that kept him out the rest of the year. So that was a big question mark going into the season. You mentioned, though, the two center forwards playing with two strikers up top with Bo and Bobby Wood. Does Vri- How does Vrioni fit into this, you know, this formation, this lineup? Because I, I just don't see how you can have Bo play anywhere else in the field right now besides with somebody by, you know, by his side up top. Well, well to answer the, the question, um, Vrioni doesn't fit in right now. <laughs> and that's, that's an issue for sure. Um, my assumption is is that when Bobby Wood inevitably goes through a little slump, as, as most centre forwards do throughout the season at some stage, that's when Brioni will come in and, and look to to make his mark. But um, given the transfer fee, which I believe was about four million dollars for him, um, given that he came from from Austria um, and uh, BSG Teichol and, and had scored a, a bucket load of goals in Austria, um, there was quite rightly an expectation, and, and he's not um, he's not fulfilled that expectation quite yet. And um, you know, I, I think with players like this, you have to give them time. Um, it, it's tough moving to a new country, believe me, uh, especially when you, you don't speak the language. I think his, his English is, is fine, um, but it's not his first language, and, and it takes time. So I, I, I know this isn't what the Rev fans want to hear, but I, I, I would plead patience with that one because I do think he, he's somebody who can play in behind. Him and Bobby Wood are, are quite similar with, with that regard, but um, I, think, uh, I think if you give it a little bit of time, just let him settle in a bit more, get him comfortable. I think Brioni is going to be okay. You hear that, Tom? Yeah, Tom. I mean, someone else has been saying that to your right for yeah. weeks now. But thank you, Callum. Appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, appreciate you backing us up. <laughs> Thanks, man. Callum Williams, MLS's season passes. Callum Williams, you can watch him for free on Apple TV when the New England Revolution take on New York City FC. Uh, and one more thing before we go. I think it's on it, – there's no question. The Brits have the best manners anywhere in yes. the world. Vocabulary, everything. Where do you stand on the phrase ma'am? Oh boy! Oh, um, <laughs> that uh, well, um, it's not one that I would use. 
Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Callum, I was hoping that's the guy we from had, You know what, Callum? Next week, you can take this seat right here. Yeah. We'll get Tom out of here. You can, you can be on the show. Callum, we had, uh, we had Kaylin Kyle on last week, and Tom greeted her by saying, thank you for joining us, ma'am. And, uh, yeah, tough. Yeah, All right. um, uh, yeah that, that's not, not the choice of wording I would have gone with, but uh, here we are. You, you've got to deal with that now, I guess, especially with Kaylin as well. She'll let you know, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. 30, she did. MLS season pass, Apple TV, Revs, New York City FC. Callum, Callum Williams, thank you man. so much. Thank you. Final segment here on New England Soccer Weekly. Callum Williams, thank you, sir, for coming on again. Uh, Gave you the answer you didn't want about Giacomo ma'am. Vironi. Oh, I thought you were going to say Vironi. Well, but all, all of I thought he above. was going to be happy. I thought I could get the Brit to say, yeah, ma'am, that's fine. I could, it's acceptable. Uh, listen, I'm sorry. Kanye West just posted on Instagram. I had to see what it was about. Oh, it's okay. I get a little nervous whenever I see that notification come up. <laughs> that Kanye's posting again? I yeah. got you. Oof. So let's wrap up the show here with this. Taylor Twelman and a lot of Revs fans were upset, and I could actually understand this one. No representation from the Revs at Red Sox opening day. All the other four teams had some type of representation at opening day for the Red Sox. The Revs stand- still can't get any love as one of the five, count them, five major teams in this area. So is that the Red Sox being petty, or do the people just not care about the Revs still? I think it's just an overlooked... You can't... How do you overlook I mean, who, it at this who point? who was the person they had come out for the Celtics? It was... Uh, uh, was no, it like Eddie House or something? No, it wasn't even an Eddie House. It was a... Uh, uh, they had Sean Thornton come out for the Bruins, which I guess he was a part of that championship team. And then I forgot who the Celtics player was. It was a name that I was not super familiar with, and I watch a lot of Celtics basketball. Yeah. So that needs to t- that just tells you it sounds like something that was put together very last minute, which is different for the Red Sox because they normally have all of these extravagant right. pregame things. I, I did not watch it. And so. David Ortiz works with the Red Sox. Works for DraftKings he's in the area. He lives yeah, in so this area, close. so he's close by. So he's he'll be there. He'll, he'll be at the opening. But of the envelope. Revs. But my, at this to your point, point though, they should be included. They should be yes. included. Yes. I, I think that. But the point I'm trying to make is that they just don't think of them. Like somebody whoever's well, organizing this for the Red Sox isn't thinking of the Revolution. But they'll have them throw out the first pitch in like July. But you know what I mean? Like, but they won't have them uh, walk out when they're representing all Boston sports teams. It makes no sense. It, it, thank you. It makes no, no sense. It doesn't make you. any sense. It's honestly disrespectful I'm with you too. at this point. I think that if you are... Are uh, the Revs f- one of the five major teams in this area, or are they closer to the Boston Breakers? No, of course they're one of the five thank major you. teams in this area. I mean, it, it's, it's stupid to me with how important this sport is in this area especially how, after the world cup and help but like what are they what are they seeing i mean what are we seeing that they're not seeing when we get all these like we're not uh claiming to be analytics guys but like we get the same tweets and notifications that they do about how uh, how much the viewership here in in Boston and Providence area and in for all, soccer all over the world and it just baffles my mind the disrespect the revolution get. I mean, the the lack of coverage, the lack of re- the lack of respect from other organizations, it makes no sense to me. And Kraft is friendly with all these guys. It's not. Like I don't know he, if Kraft is necessarily friendly with the Henrys and the Pizzutis. That's just me, though. I want to say friendly, but they're all billionaires. They got to be like cool. I would say they probably wh- have their own group chat, some like Illuminati type stuff. I don't know. <laughs> I would say the Jacobs We're on YouTube. Yeah, that's fine. I would say the Jacobs family. That's a good point. Probably the most separated from the Boston area. They're not even from Boston, right? They're a bunch of Buffalo people that own the Bruins. Um, Wick, he's like Switzerland, right? Everybody loves Wick. Everybody loves the Celtics. But you're breaking down something like this. The Patriots were there, so why weren't the Revolution there? It's not like it was— Because they were the Patriots. No, that's that would... not my point, though. My point is, is like if it's either all or nothing. So if you're, if you're going to have— it, Who was there for point? the Patriots? I don't know. Let me pull up the picture. Because you're, you're, if, if it was a— I should cre- have it on the box. If it was I, a, I should post everything else in the box If it was an, um, an ownership-on-ownership ownership thing, then there would have just been the Boston-based teams there. There wouldn't be the Patriots. You know? I, I just— it, it, I don't know. It it doesn't make any sense to me. Where and, shout and, out to Twelman too for you know shout for out to calling it out. Yeah, what that makes tweet it out worse? There. What makes it worse to me is when later on they'll have them there as if they really care about them. Yeah, and it's like but it's like Revs night. But you realize that you completely disrespected them by not including them with all of the other. Prof- like it's supposed to be Boston Day, man. Red Sox, and then you lose on opening day to the Orioles. So I think mean, it's almost bad karma there. For Rev fans, you, you got a, a rare Mike D baseball tweet yesterday. That was that was interesting. Well, you know, uh, sadly, I am a diehard Red Sox. Well, same, fan. but yeah. 
Now you know, but game one of one sixty two. Are you really a Red Sox fan? Die hard, the Red Sox fan. Like yes, that. Tom. Yes, Tom. Yes, yes. We're we're different up here. You know, we're not. We're we're different. You know in what? New though, England. I will. Here is where I'll. You know, you have a saving grace here is that you're, at least you're a Mets fan. So well, I'm a Mets fan. I, I can't stand the Yankees. I absolutely hate the Yankees. I hate that you, you love a tough the Giants. Day <laughs> Listen to the Yankees on seven ninety the score all season long. By the way, yeah. Doesn't mean we have to be Yankees fans. No, then we're not. Um, but yeah, I thought that was if you know what I'm usually one of these people that does roll my eyes. Where why are we included? I mean, screw everybody else. But like this one, it's like you got the pageantry out there. It is. If you're clearly making it a big deal, having all the major sports teams out there, and you know what, Bruce Arena has worked his ass off to make this thing work here. Mm. And to, true. to to and and it, and and it has absolutely changed the opinion, not just from a fan ba- base standpoint, but look at the media. We got competition in the mornings. You know what you can go listen to at six a.m. on ninety-eight five, the Sports Hub. We prefer, and you are listening here. But at the end of the day, there's growth, and the Red Sox are purposely ignoring that growth. That's all I got to say. Yeah, but the thing is, though, what's even sadder, Tom, is I don't think they're doing it on purpose. I just think that it's not – the revolution are not on their mind. The, what, the second the revs move in – I don't think to, they're actively choosing to be like, what about the revolution? Nah, I just think they're not thinking of them. The second the revs move into the Boston area, it will be the biggest competition the Red Sox have ever had in their history during the summertime. The Red Sox are kings of Boston during summer. Oh, during the summertime, And the second yes. the revs move in, that will challenge that bottom line, and I can guarantee you – John Henry is praying to God the Massachusetts state legislature goes all green and never allows that stadium to be built on the waterfront. And we need to pray to God, or wherever it is you believe in, that John Henry does not buy the revolution. Because I do not want happen. that guy. Listen, that John Henry, never happen. I will never want you owning the revolution. I don't even want you owning the Red Sox. You can own Liverpool, though, if you want. You can ruin them. Which he did. And now the uh, Saudis are going to buy them. Seems like it. Saudis buy are everybody. buying everybody. They're buying everybody. WWE. Did they buy you yet? Bruce? (laughs) Great, thank you.